Telecast. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to another Telecast. My guest this week is hugely experienced British film director, TV producer, media executive, and founder of September Films and Three Tables Productions, David Green. Welcome to Telecast, David. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Great to have you here. So, um, where do we start? We've got a lot to run through today <laughs> um, in terms of your career. So, why don't we start at the beginning? Because I think Yorkshire TV was maybe the first stop on this uh, long and in- yeah. illustrious career. But tell, tell me about how you got started in TV. Yeah, so um, I was fascinated by television from formative years through my early teens. I always loved television drama, television documentaries. There was only BBC and ITV in those days, of course. Um, and, you know, but I always wanted to become a television director. That was my, my passion. So um, after college, I went, uh, I, got, um, I got offered several things by the BBC and ITV, but Yorkshire television was what I really wanted uh, more than anything. Um, and I, I, the, I, the reason I got offered a few things, I did a, my, my last thing at college was I directed Colin Welland's first stage play. So that at the wow. Edinburgh Festival, so that got me a lot of attention. And the best offer I got was coming to Yorkshire as a general trainee. Now, I knew they had a good drama department, a stellar documentary department. So it seemed to me the place to start. I thought, general trainee, I'll go straight in and be working on great shows. It didn't quite work out like that. Life never quite works out like that when you're young. And in fact, I, went, I, I ended up on a quiz show writing questions and finding contestants. The, the writing questions thing was a lot of fun. The finding contestants, I had to travel all over, all over Britain to do that. But um, they promised me a trainee directorship because they liked the work I was doing. And at 24, I was made a trainee director with ITV um, and I got my ACTT card. And there were six of us got, who got those, um, those traineeships. There was no such thing as training. It didn't exist. It was, it was, um, it was a rather strange word, really. Um, my training was that on Monday morning in April, whenever it was in the 70s, April um, 74, I actually was told to report to a new soap that was being made called Emmerdale. Emmerdale Farm, it was called in those days. That's right. So Monday morning I reported and my producer, Peter Holmans, walked in and he threw two scripts on my desk and he said, you're in the studio Thursday and Friday shooting these. And that was my training. I mean, it was a baptism of, of fire and I... Don't know how it got through it to this day, but I think I got a lot of help from a lot of very experienced people. And I went on to, at the age of 24, direct 60 episodes of Emmerdale, the very early episodes, some of the very early episodes, which was a fantastic experience. It got me into drama. And I thought, when I did these 60 episodes over two years, I then did a children's television series called Nobody's House. But I thought, here I am at the best documentary unit in Britain. I, while I'm here and while I'm young, I would see if I can trans- transition across because I'd always come back to drama. So they gave me a gig on um, a couple of documentaries. I did a documentary series on European communism with Robert Key. I did a series, uh, a high-end American medical series with Austin Mitchell in America. Um, I did films with Sir John Gielgud and Lord Mountbatten of Burma. Um, and best of all... I landed as Alan Wicker's producer-director. Alan Wicker. Uh, Was that on Wicker's World? That was Wicker's World. I did 29 episodes of Wicker's World between the ages of 28 and 33, flew all around the world, shooting on 60mm film. And that was, for me, my training on film. Not so much Emmerdale, which was half studio, half video and half film inserts. This was real film. So that was just a wonderful experience. And funnily enough, just as an aside, I'm actually one of the judges on the Wickers at the Sheffield uh, Documentary Festival uh, this year. Um, he left a bequest for young first-time documentary directors to get money to make films, much harder now than it was when I started. So I'm very proud to be giving something back in that way, really. And that's actually very exciting. We just did the judging uh, the other day, and we go up to Edinburgh and do the final, th- to Edinburgh, to um, Sheffield to do the final thing in June. But anyway, Wicker led me on to... Um, I, I worked with David Frost as well and um, I did a film about Elvis with him, which caught the attention of someone at the BBC who said to me, what do you want to do next? I said, I want to come back into drama. I haven't, I haven't done any yet. So I got a gig on a, uh, a, 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 a thriller called Chinese Detective and then a couple of very big um, period pieces, East Lynn, which was a, a BBC Two network special, which was number one in the ratings, and then a 
four part series called Wilfred and Eileen. So that, that got me back into drama and got me on the drama ladder. Uh, but I wanted to make movies. And so I then um, transitioned from, I thought the way to do it, because it, it was hard in those days to make that transition. I thought the way to do it was to make commercials. So I made commercials for a couple of years, learned to shoot on 35 millimeter film. Um, did 50 campaigns, including, you know, an award-winning campaign for Red Mountain, films with Peter Ustinov and all sorts of people. And got my first movie gig um, after my commercial stint, uh, a film called Car Trouble, which led on to probably my biggest, my best-known um, movie, which was Buster, with Phil Collins and Julie Walters, uh, which became a mega hit all over the world, it was one of the biggest British films of the 80s. Um, that was a wonderful experience. Yeah, um, well, it must have been, and it, that launched Phil Collins' career in the States, I would imagine. I mean, or, he was, I mean, already a, known as a musician, but obviously less so of an actor. Was that his first acting role? That was his first acting role in movies. He actually, um, the reason he, we wanted Bob Hoskins to play the role, um, but my wife at the time was actually watching television. She said, come in here, this is, here's Buster Edwards. And it was Phil Collins in an episode of Miami Vice with, with Don Johnson playing a cockney, a cockney white boy. And of course, there he was, there was, there was our Buster. And it was much more original and a unique bit of casting, of course, than the great Bob Hoskins. So it was Phil, Phil's first film and he was fantastic. To this day, um, we, got, we got nominated for the Oscar for best, for her best song. And I think to this day, it's only one of four films in movie history that's had, had two number one hit records from it, Groovy Kind of Love and um, Two Hearts, which was nominated for the Oscar. Wow. So from there, I was offered several things in Hollywood. Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was running Disney at the time, said, come over. He said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I, I just, I want to make good films out of good scripts, basically. All the, I, I didn't really know what to say. I was kind of tongue, a bit tongue-tied. And he said, well, you know, We've got this action movie. I said, well, I've never done action. He said, yeah, but you're a director. You can, if you can ride You'll a bike, you can ride, ride, you can ride a bike, drive a car. I was back to Emmerdale with the two scripts being thrown on my desk, basically. So they gave me a, a, a 22 million, which was a lot of money at that time, um, action adventure movie to direct called Firebirds uh, with Nicolas Cage, Tommy Lee Jones and Sean Young. I remember it was Wings of the Apache, Wings of the Apache outside here, the US. Outside the US, yeah. I had 500 Apache helicopters in Texas to play with. The Pentagon was supplying all sorts of stuff. Um, and it was, as big a, it was as big a bomb as Buster was a hit. Having made this huge hit movie, I then went to Hollywood. It didn't do well at all. Right. It, it only took about 15 million bucks off his butt. It became a huge hit on video, which was, of course, that time was the way you kind of Trans transition from... Was that VHS or DVD? It was VHS at that time. Right. So it was a huge hit on that and also huge television success. I mean, BBC, it played to 8 million viewers when it was on. So having failed at the box office in America, it did well at the, at the thingy, at the... Um, it, yeah. did, it did well. So I think um, that led me to thinking... Um, we had a couple of personal tragedies in, in, in LA, my, my wife and I, um, and so we, we thought it was time to come home. And um, Channel 4 had started, there was a chance to start um, a production company. And really that's how September Films happened. I went back and started September Films thinking, wrongly, that I was gonna make movies. I had this track record, and I thought I could, I could then become a producer as well as the director. But actually that didn't happen. I mean, um, because the first project I did was such a huge success that I became the innovator and starter of Factual Entertainment on British television in, in 1993 with a series called Hollywood Women, which to this day has the biggest audience ever for a Factual Entertainment program, 12 million viewers and a 52% audience share. Wow. And what was that? Tell us about Hollywood. Hollywood Women then. was really part of my experience of living and working in Hollywood for five years with Jeffrey Katzenberg and Arnold Copelson and Keith Barish, my producers. It was basically um, a series of interviews with top Hollywood women, um, actresses, actors, producers, um, who um, was breaking through the glass ceiling of being a woman. It was really hard in Hollywood in the 80s and the 90s, they were beginning to break through. So it was a four part series and it was slightly tongue in cheek. It was factual entertainment. I always used to say that Wicker's World was the first factual entertainment program because Alan 
entertained while informing. And we tried to do the same. I think we entertained more than we informed with Hollywood Women, to be honest. <laughs> um, and um, so Hollywood Women took off. It spawned 10 Hollywood series. And, it, and September took off as a factual entertainment and factual documentary company. We did make some films, which was my original ambition. We made a film called Solomon and Gaynor, which was nominated for an Oscar. It was nominated for an Oscar because it was a Welsh language version, because S4C had put some money into it. And um, that, the Welsh language version got it nominated as best foreign language film. Um, we, we made a film called House of America, which won several awards. Um, I made my own film for September called Breathtaking, which was a sky picture, a, a thriller. But um, the movies never really were the bedrock of the company, and a good job too, because I wouldn't have built it into a into a into a major indie, which I did. And uh, so, tell us about that experience then of of building uh, w w what I imagine was a a transatlantic factual production company right from the beginning. Because um, I guess you said that you know you wanted to make movies, but actually you found out that, you know, your experience and what you'd seen in Hollywood led to, you know, some of the programming. Hollywood, yeah. Time of the programming and also my own background in documentaries in my Yorkshire days. So I had that, I was very lucky and I, I'm very, very lucky because I came of a generation where you could do both. You could do drama and you could do documentary and I did. I don't think filmmakers, program makers, directors, producers can do that anymore. It's quite, quite rare. Everyone is put into a box now. And I fight so hard to make sure that my producers and directors um, get the chance to do everything if they can. It's hard, very hard, because you know, you're not only put into a box, but the box is tiny. I mean, it's actually, it's not just one area of factual or one area of drama. It's you've got to make um, hospital films about, for, for drama, or you've got to make um, documentaries about blue light, flashing blue lights for, and so on, for, for, for factual. So it's very, very small boxes. So um, that gave me, but it gave me the chance to do both, really. And so tell us about the, the rise of September films then. So we were going for, we started in 93 when I came back from working in Hollywood and um, we made over 2,000 hours of primetime television. We were the biggest makers of primetime factual entertainment in, in, in the country at the time. Um, we were overtaken as the years went by by other 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 uh, giants like RDF, but we 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 were we started it off, and I was proud that we started it off. We also did serious documentaries, um, pioneering documentaries. People don't remember that; they only remember the kind of loud and 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 um, slightly brash films that we made. But we made a we we made a f films about uh, true crime and about um, and a lot of it was American based. We had an office in America for all that time from 92 all the way through to 2013 when I stepped aside from DCD Media who bought September Films in 2007. And uh, so most of your projects were transatlantic in terms of their outlook or would, would it always need to have an, a, a US potential buyer in place for you to make a project or were you making domestic UK uh, projects as well? It's a very good question. I mean, I think looking back, most of our projects were fully funded by, by, by uh, British broadcasters, by particularly ITV, who we were, we, we were a major supplier to, but also by the BBC and Channel 4 and later on, you know, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the digital channels that came along. Um, we very rarely used co-production monies until the later days in the, in the mid 2000s when you had to get go and get discovery to co-produce um, and the like. So it was it was a um, it was it was an evolutionary process rather than a revolutionary one, really. Well, you've you've been through lots of different cycles in the TV industry at the film business as well, but um, predominantly in the TV industry. And we're going to come back to that in a little while, but. One of those has been about establishing franchises, uh, which you did with Bridezilla's at, uh, at uh, September Field. Tell us about the, the development of that. So, you know, part, I always used to think of myself when I was younger as a serious program maker, but actually the things I'm best known for are the slightly flippant um, things that I invented, like the Hollywood franchise and Bridezilla's, which um, went to 10 seasons, actually, for Wii TV. We made that directly for an American broadcaster. Um, it was hugely successful. I think I, I, 
I claim that I established the word in the British language. Other people claim it too. Um, Success is many fathers, <laughs> right? And um, so, so Bridezilla's was one of our big ones. We had another series called Billy the Exterminator, which was funded by A&E Television in America. So as the years went on, more and we, our American office um, was, um, was d doing their own projects independently of the UK, as well as servicing the UK projects. So it was, a, it was a mixed bag. I was very lucky to have some terrific executives at September Films who are all big names in the industry still. Um, Sammy Norman, who went on to Keshet and is now consulting very brilliantly for people. Um, Sally Miles, who uh, started Passion Distribution and is now uh, working, uh, working as an executive producer. Um, Elaine Day. Max Romney, who is a big wheel at Pact now, um, Pamela Covey, who ran my who ran my American office. I had some uh, fantastic creatives like Peter Davy, who's at BBC now, doing all the all the all the the charity shows. Um, Sheldon Lazarus, um, Janine Waddell in the old days. So I was very lucky. I had terrific people around. You're only as good as the people who work for you. And in my case, I always used to think they worked with me. And. Um what was it like working with Ozzy Osbourne? So you, you had a show, Ozzy Osbourne Uncut, right? Yeah, so I went to Dawn Airy and um, where Channel 5 started and said, you know, I'd like to make something for you. She said, yeah, you're, you're perfect for us. You do popular television. Um, we want to do a film about famous people. I said, oh, OK, that seems fairly broad. Um, can we do kind of profiles of famous people? And I said, I suppose we can. Yeah, we'll have a look at it. We ended up doing 26 half hours. The first one was with Michael Caine in, in South Beach, who, where he was opening a new restaurant, believe it or not. Um, we also did one with, um, with Ozzy Osbourne, who people, when we said we wanted to do a film with Osbourne, they all said, who? He was not well known in, 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 when, uh, when we actually filmed him in... When was it now? Probably the, the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, but we, we, we negotiated with his, his wife, Sharon Osborne, and we had... And what was that like? What was <laughs> negotiating with Sharon Osborne like? Um, robust. Yes, OK. <laughs> Which I imagine Banerjee are finding now, because I think the Osborne's is coming back, isn't it? It and, is, uh, yeah. Uh, in the near future. Sally Miles so. was the person who, um, who, who actually did the negotiations, and you could hear them talking many miles away. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I wish it had been a fly on the wall in those <laughs> conversations. So the Osborne, Osborne, of course, spawned the big, this huge franchise for MTV, which we were not a part of. Did that come off the back of that? Do you think? I it mean, did. She showed, she used Sharon used our film to to get that made. She went around around Hollywood quite openly, and she admitted it, showing our film to get her series made. Yeah. But you can't you can't bottle a personality. You can't. No. You know. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. Um, so DCD Media bought September Films, and then a few years later, you you decided to uh, to leave September behind. What what did you do then? Well, the DCD thing is just worth mentioning briefly because I thought, oh, okay, I've got a three year service contract, which I will I'll, I'll, I'll know I'm very fastidious and very meticulous in everything I do. So I thought I really I do this well and make sure I leave behind me after three years. I ended up staying three six years because they immediately made me creative director of the group of companies that they owned at the time, um, and I, I listed them somewhere. Um, we had some big companies, um, Box TV, Dun & Dusted, September Films, of course, Iambic, NBD, NBD Distribution, West Park Pictures, Matchline. I mean, some, a lot of companies. So I became creative director for, for the group. And then our CEO left and they said to me, look, would you become CEO? And I said, no, I don't want to become CEO of a publicly quoted, publicly listed media company, a PLC. They said, well, just do it for three months. Of course, I ended up doing it for three years. Um, I, it was okay. I, it was certainly an experience, but um, I then stepped down and became chairman of the group and eventually went to America and ran our September Films American office, which was where my passion was because I was back in the creative world. And eventually I left in 2013. Right. And and you were living in Malibu and uh, you... you partner was Jane Seymour, right? Is that that's that's correct? Yeah, Jane and I, uh, Jane and I had known each other since the, the 1980s when I tried to get her to do a, a, a drama for BBC, which she agreed to do, and then the money fell out. So we kind of knew each other. 
try to get her on an Alan Wicker show about Brits in Hollywood when she was the, the, the hottest thing in Hollywood. She, she, we, did, we couldn't get hold of her, we couldn't reach her at all. And then finally, um, I did interview her for Hollywood Women, so we got to know each other better then. And eventually, um, when my marriage broke up, we, um, we started dating and um, we lived together for 10 years and only, only separated. I separated from her in August. We're still friends and uh, we have a project together still, a, a Beatles film that we're, 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 we're hoping to set up. Um, all right, tell us about that, a Beatles film. I mean, so I'm a, all over the Beatles. So, so it's a fiction that, uh, that Jane and I um, c conceived about, um, based on an apocryphal story that John Lennon told about um, uh, the drummer who just drummed for them for 10 weeks, for 10 days. And, um, he, and our story is that he claimed, it's based on what Lennon said, claimed that he actually was involved in the lyrics of four of the big songs including Nowhere, Nowhere Man and one or two others, and um, disappears into a, an institution and comes out 40 years later announcing that he was a Beatle for 10, for 10 days. Right, okay. And it's based on the true fact because there was Ringo, a Ringo went missing, didn't he? Or he, he was ill or something, and, and they had a fill-in drummer. They had a fill-in. And our, our fill-in um, fill guy, who's called Herbert Kunkel in the film, he actually is 18 at the time, drumming for a school, you know, still at school, drumming for a, for, a, for a local band. And George and Paul go to see him and they think he's fantastic and they need someone urgently. They go back to John and they say, oh, t tell me about him, says John. And John said, well, um, he, he's a great drummer. Not, not, the, not, not, the, the, not the best looking person on the planet. Oh, we can't have him. We're all pretty boys. We can't have him. Um, I tell you what we do. If he's good, we'll we'll have him, but we'll turn his back to the we'll turn the drums back to the stage, so, and he'll take the lights off him, so no one will see him, just hear him. And that's our story. It's the story of Herbert Kunkel and his, him coming out with the true story forty years later. And after the success of um, of um, Danny Boyle's film, we, we feel we have a shot with it. So yeah. Jane and I are looking to cast that at the moment. All right, exciting. And. Um what was it like then living in Malibu? Because that must have been a very Hollywood lifestyle for you, living in Malibu for a decade. Yes, it was. It was very different to uh, to, to anything I'd known, really. Um, I suppose if I'm if I'm brutally honest, and Jane's wonderful, and we're, and we're still good friends, and we had a, we had a wonderful ten years together. I suppose I lost my identity a little bit um, as a program maker, as a filmmaker, which was is is what is really what, what I'm most passionate about. I found that as the years went by, I became more and more Jane Seymour's partner. And that's part of the reason, I think, why I separated in the end, although there were other personal reasons as well. It was a mutual decision. But I think I found that quite... And I've heard that from other people in Hollywood, that whether you're with, when you're with a celebrity or a big name, you tend to get labelled as the other person, the other man. The plus man, one. The plus one. That's a very good way of putting it, Justin. Yeah, the other person. And... Um, so that, that that was always a, an issue, but it was it was great living in the red carpet lifestyle and you know going to all the parties and traveling all around the world with Jane and I was very supportive. She's fantastically talented, never stops working. Has a big series on Acorn at the moment called Harry Wilde, which is in its third season. Um, she's the hardest working person I think I've ever met, and you know she's also a great philanthropist and does lots of good work. Um, she's a businesswoman, has her own jewelry line. So yeah, I can't. Speak more highly of her, really. So bring us up to date, then. Um, I introduced you as the uh, the founder of Three Tables Productions. Tell us about Three Tables, then. Uh, th is this uh, just purely scripted that you're you're focusing on? Yeah, everything I, everything I do now is just scripted dramas, um, long running series, um, developing long running series for the streamers, and this is nothing I've only started a couple of years ago. You know, um, but I believe that there is an enormous demand and will continue to be an enormous demand. And I know we'll go on to talk about the state of the industry, but I think there will continue to be an enormous demand for scripted drama series. I think the streamers have changed the game, have moved the goalposts. So I, I wanted to get in that not just for commercial reasons, but of course you have to make a company sustainable because I believe that's where a lot of the best work in television um, is being made and can be made in the years to come. So I set up Three Tables Productions. Um, they came to me actually, JD, 
J.D. Wong and, the, and uh, Himesh Kaur, who are the two senior creatives. J.D. is also the managing director. They came to me um, through a friend of mine, David Wong, who, um, who I have another project with. And, um, and they said, you know, would you be interested in becoming part of us and becoming our chairman? And I said, you bet I would. And um, it's been a wonderful experience, um, just developing, doing nothing but developing um, a lot of high end and, and um, lower tier drama projects. And we have an enormous slate, which I'm, I'm very happy to tell you a little bit about. Yeah, well, do yeah. Uh, tell us what's uh, what's on yeah, the slate. So, what so, your I mean, are you are you actually in are you in development at the moment? Yes, or are you in production. Of no, we any? haven't. Got, we're about to go into production this year with our first uh, with our first project. Um, but we're in development with a lot of broadcasters, a lot of streamers, and a lot of and a lot a lot of books we bought, a lot of writers we've been working with. We're very broadly spread. So, for example, we are the first thing that, that we hope will go this year is a project called Emma's Baby, which is a, a four part uh, thriller. Um, set between Liverpool and Dublin, and um, we've got Virgin Media and Screen Ireland involved in in, in funding that. Um, e One, who are now Lionsgate, a deficit funding it as distributor. Um, it's a uh, it leans into the maternal mental health world. It's about a mother who loses her child on the tube, which feeds into every mother's greatest fear, of course. Um, it's a very powerful thriller. It's, everything is not as it seems, as it as it unfolds. We've got Alan Whiting writing it from a book by Abby Taylor. So that's that's something we hope will go this year. Um, in America, we have um, we have a project with Apple, um, which we're very excited about. Can't I mean, they won't let us say much about it, sadly. But I can tell you that it's a co-production. Something we're very keen on co-productions. No one, no one is no one is big enough to do it all by themselves anymore. We have a co-production with Appian Way, which is Leonardo DiCaprio's company. Yeah. So that gives us a certain amount of leverage and, and clout in LA. Um, we have a project with BBC Drama called Critical Incidents, um, which is da- adapting Lucy Whitehouse's novel and series of books. Um, it's a female-led um, six, six by 60 uh, crime series uh, written by Naomi uh, Ghibli, Ghibli. And um, we have... Uh, uh, ITVX, we have an eco thriller. Uh, Channel Four, we're doing a rom com series. We're developing a rom com series for uh, S Four C. Um, we're doing a series called a family drama called Dragons, inspired by J T Wong, uh, one of our two senior creatives. His family history in Port Talbot in Wales, and Simon Evans is directing that. Um, we have a project with Buzzfeed Studios, right? Which is based on again, I can't tell you too much about it, but it's, it's we're working with them to develop a major part, a piece of their IP. Um, we're working with um, the Royal Opera House to do a period dra- six by sixty period drama. Um, How many is that? There's about eight or nine projects you've got. Yeah, going a, on few, there's a few more to come. Um, right. <laughs> uh, we've got um, uh, Plunder. Uh, did I mention Plunder? No. Nope. Plunder is a high, it's an eight by sixty heist thriller with ZDF Studios backing. Um, We've got a book called Robert Barron's Daughter, which Red Arrow are backing. So we're very broadly spread among um, a lot of broadcasters, some streamers. And I think it's a compliment not to me, but to, to JT um, and, um, and um, Himesh that we have, we have managed to put so much into advanced development. Well, absolutely. And... and- Particularly as the market is as it is right now, which is depressed. Many people say it's a broken market, or certainly the TV industry model that we've known for the last sort of ten or twenty years is is broken. Um, you've been—I mentioned it earlier. You've been through a couple of different cycles, a couple of different turns of the wheel, if you like, when it comes to the TV industry and how that's changed with uh, the the way of um, consumer consumption of content. Um, if you were to start an indie right now from afresh, um, how would you do it? I mean, uh, you've talked about scripted, scripted drama for uh, TV or, or drama series being your focus, but... If you were somebody without all your contacts and or are without all your experience, and if you were starting off fresh now, how would you approach it? Well, what interests me about what's happening at the moment is I think there's a gap in the marketplace for feature-length documentaries, for a company that, that specialises in feature-length documentaries. I think it's a whole new area. 
Um, a whole new growth area. It's come from nowhere. Ten years ago, you could not get a feature length documentary funded for for love and or money. And now that everyone wants them, Netflix, Amazon, all the big streamers, all the big broadcasters. Um, and there's a real hunger for uh, for really good projects that are based at, largely, unfortunately, mostly on celebrity or sport. It's difficult to, to oh, there's some true crime as well, although true crime is difficult because it, they're very difficult to kind of substantiate those, those true crime stories. But there is an enormous hunger for it. Um, I think I think Jane Root is is rightly credited with starting the Megadocs um, some years ago, um, probably um, in, in about 2007, 2008, around the time of the, of the crash, I think. And she got in. She was brilliant with that. I mean, she became the person that really pushed Megadocs into the worldwide consciousness. And I think I would like to take that one stage for, further and do a strictly limited but focused feature doc company if I was to be given the opportunity. Right. I'm not sure I have the time or the bandwidth, <laughs> but I think there was, there was room for someone there, and I hope someone else does it divide it, because there's not many companies specializing in just feature-length documentaries, it seems to me. And you took, you and it's by the way, it's just sorry to interrupt. But it's just high end. We're talking about high end, expensive projects. I mean, a million dollars plus an hour. I mean, these are this is where the demand is. So this is blue chip, factual, feature length docs. Um, are you talking about with talent, major talent attached? Yeah, often with major talent, with major, with major, um, either about major talent themselves or with major talent sort of uh, narrating. Um, I think it's interesting because television, British television, in my experience, has always done very well with television stars. But I think feature film stars are now needed to hit a worldwide audience, I think, because they're known everywhere. So often with feature film people and um, sports documentaries, of course. I mean, um, Fullwell have been brilliant at doing that. So they've, they've done both the personality thing and the sports thing. Um, but I think there's a, there's a room for a specialist high-end feature-length documentary company. And now it's time for Story of the Week, where my guests get to nominate their TV industry news story of the past seven days that's caught their eye. David, what's your Story of the Week? Well, my Story of the Week really comes from the fact that I'm very optimistic about the industry and we need to be looking. It's 20, 2023 was a bad year, 2024 not much better. But I'm optimistic. I mean, there are more people, more people seeking content worldwide than ever before. Um, Give us reasons to be optimistic, though, David. I mean, that's the thing. There's so much that, as you say, there is so much negativity just because, because the broadcasters well, are not. It, it, there may be much more, uh, many more buyers out there, but they're not buying at the moment. That's, well, I, I think it's up to us, the producers, to actually get out there and find ways of, of, of selling because I think people are consuming more content than ever before. Um, there are surveys and there's research to show this, and and people respond to you know creative ambition. They respond to innovation. There's more and more ways of watching things, different ways, different ways of delivery. And we as producers must be much more proactive in finding ways of of, of feeding this huge need for content and not stick to the old tried and tested ways. Um, and I think my story of the week comes from that because I think. The British, I mean, Andy Harris said, and I wrote down his quote, he said uh, last week, uh, UK, the UK is in danger of becoming a top-end service industry for Hollywood. Um, and that's not really my story. My story really is Jane Tranter because she quite rightly, and this is a way to increase the output in, in Britain, she quite rightly said that um, the government, she was sitting on a committee for uh, culture, media and sport. Uh, she was talking to them and, and um, being grilled by them. And she said it's really unfair that, that in the recent budget, feature films um, up to 50 million, the hardest ones to actually finance, have got these fantastic tax breaks now. But TV drama, which is the lifeblood of British television and is known worldwide, is not getting the same tax, break, tax breaks. And I think it's time that that was looked at and, and, and dealt with. And I think she's absolutely right. And I think for me, that is a story that kind of got lost. It was, actually, it was actually brought to my attention by Himesh Kaur, one of my two senior creatives at Three Tables. And, and he and JT Wong said, you know, this is a story that may be worth you talking about. And I'd like to talk about it because Jane is absolutely right. Yeah. Let's get the British government 
whoever the government is, and it'll probably be a Labour government next, let's get them to think about TV drama in the way they're now thinking about feature film. That will help increase the productivity, the amount of business that's available, and it's a very, would be a very positive thing for, for British television. And what about the poor factual producers then? Um, I mean, I've seen calls on uh, LinkedIn across the industry for, you know, what about us? You know, we're, we're, uh, we're getting left behind. Where do, what's your feeling on that? I think that's a good point. And I think, you know, they think it's hard, much harder for factual. They're not, they don't get the breaks. Although, interestingly enough, the, initi the initiative in the spring 24 budget for feature films under 15,000, the ones that are harder to, to film, of course, by definition, include feature length doc documentaries. So they will get those breaks. Um, but you're right, the, the more level two and level the tier two and tier three things uh, are not getting the tax breaks more. And I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, I think I think I think factual may have, factual entertainment as we uh, as we knew it and formats may have re peaked at, have may have peaked, whereas drama still has enormous potential. That doesn't mean factual is going to go anywhere, but I think it's probably peaked. And where do you sit when it comes to the social media giants, really, that are becoming the most influential businesses on the planet? Um, and you know, really swallowing up the media industry. I mean, the media industry is just a tiny speck to what, you know, these technology companies are, uh, are, are valued at. Um, how do you see the media industry surviving? Because, you know, the, the method of consumption has changed now in terms of younger people and where they're consuming content. They're not consuming it necessarily through Netflix and uh, through the streamers. They want to access content through YouTube or any of the other social networks? I mean, how, how do you see the future for, for, for content on social media? Well, I, th I, think, it, I think it's, um, it's constantly changing. I think there is room um, within the whole industry to, to, to encompass the two. Of course, the, 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 um, the traditional channels and the, the digital channels are, are, are fighting an uphill battle against the power of the streamers. And I think the streamers, by the way, will consolidate. There'll be a lot of consolidation in, in the next few years. Um, and that's not necessarily a good thing. It's more power in less hands. It's a bit like the old Hollywood studios, of course. But I do think there's room um, for, um, for everything. I really do think there's room to, to find ways of, of, of making programs for new forms of delivery, for people standing at a train station watching a, a quick story on their phone. I think there's ways of making content and you've got to, I think people have got to think universally, how do you do that on a universal level? Um, I don't, th I think things are constantly changing. I don't think anything is beyond the bounds, bounds of clever, innovative producers. I really don't. And now it's time for Hero of the Week where David gets to nominate the person that he's putting on a pedestal. David, who's your hero of the week? Well, there's absolutely no doubt who is my hero of the week, and I hope everyone's hero of the week, and that's Kate Middleton, Princess of Wales. What a what a, a moving and disarming and totally honest statement she made the other day with grace and dignity when she's been under such fire by every element of the media. Um, it's been disgraceful what's gone on, actually. The grace with which she talked about herself in the in terms of her family and her responsibilities and duty, not in terms of her ego, I think was exemplary. Um, what a performance, what a story. David, and now it's time for Get In The Bin. Who or what are you telling to get in the bin this week? Well, unequivocally, leading on from my last, uh, my last choice of Kate Middleton, definitely get in the bin all the idiots, all the bots, all the people worldwide who, stood, who stirred up this media storm, this frenzy of, of lies and untruths, um, ridiculous stories about, you know, about touched up photographs and visits to farm shops with, with surrogates or um, whatever. I mean, it was just unbelievable. So they can all, as far as I'm concerned, get in the bin. I hope they've learned their lesson because I think the serious side of it, Justin, is that there were shades of what happened to Princess Diana um, in, in everything that has gone on in the last few weeks. And um, her son, um, William, has now found it 
happening with his own wife and his own family. Um, I feel sorry for him. Everyone can get in the bin who has actually created these, this furore, this vitriolic, um, this vitriolic uh, campaign against her. Yes. All right. Well, the media conspiracists and uh, uh, anyone who's trying to profit from that um, can get in the bin. David, thank you so much for joining us this week. It's been fascinating to talk through all your uh, your storied career. I wish you all the very best uh, at Three Tables, and um, we'll see you very soon. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Well, that's about it for this week's show. Telecast was recorded in London and produced by Spirit Studios. We'll be back with another show exploring the business of the TV industry next week. Until then, stay safe. <laughs>